I see on social media right now is gentle parenting on TikTok and Instagram or grace-based parenting or conscious parenting, which is about enforcing more positive than negative. It's basically a huge 180 from authoritative parenting. And according to parents.com, it's described as parenting without shame, blame, or punishment. Okay, wow. So that bumped for me. No punishment? My intuition bristled. It encourages parents to be less demanding and collaborative on how they parent with their kids. Big yikes for me, but let's just see what else they say. Okay, so instead of tie your shoes, please, parents.com suggests saying, do you think it would be a good idea to tie your shoes so they don't slip off when playing outside? In the middle of a meltdown, parents.com suggests you ask your child to tell you what they're thinking and let them release their big emotions. Now, as a Christian, I had some questions. If some trendy parenting philosophy is universally loved and accepted by godless parents, shouldn't that be a huge indicator for a Christian to take a step back and look at this closer? If the world loves it, wouldn't that be a problem? I asked one of my Christian mom friends of four what she thought about this, and her answer intrigued me. She said, Alex, biblical parenting is gentle, but gentle parenting is not biblical. Now, as as has become routine for me, I like to find topics and interviews to do sometimes on this podcast that might not be something I necessarily relate to personally, but that I know is relevant to my audience, which, I mean, I'm just throwing this out there and I'm guessing, but I'm pretty sure is over 90% young moms. And I'm not pretending to be anything other than curious, all right? I am not a parenting expert. I just have questions and I have suspicions about this trend, but I'm going to have a mom of 10 on today who is a Christian and parenting author herself. And she's gonna walk us through why she believes gentle parenting is unbiblical. I also ask her what discipline techniques have worked for her in her large family, how she's overcome difficult seasons where maybe she didn't have the energy to discipline, and what the Bible says disciplining children should look like. This isn't an episode telling you how to parent. This is an episode telling you how one mom parents. And really, just the whole episode is looking at the clear parenting guidelines that are outlined in scripture and how they hold up to the gentle parenting philosophy. So it's not really about what I say or what my guest says or about what anyone says on the internet, but it is about what scripture says. And scripture has a lot to say about how we should parent. Please welcome Abby Halberstadt, AKA M is for mama to the spillover. Abby, you have 10 kids. So much fun. What are the ages of them? Um, I have almost three-year-old twins. I don't know when this is airing, but by the time it airs, they may actually be three-year-old twins because their birthday is September 24th, which, by the way, is the same birthday as my other set of twins. Wait, you have two sets of twins born on the same day? I do. Are you joking? No. What, no. did, you, what did the doctor say about that? <laughs> The same as everybody else. The same as you just said. Uh, how is that even possible? Holy I have hell. a set of identical girl twins who will be 11 on September 24th. And I have a set of identical boy twins, which that in and of itself is really unusual because identical is supposed to be random and you're not supposed to have a higher likelihood than someone else of having it happen. And these are always, natural? Yes. Yes. And everyone's like, oh, so twins run in your family, right? And I'm like, well... Identical twins aren't supposed to have anything to do with hereditary issues. It's just supposed to be like this special gift from God. So I have almost three-year-old little boy twins all the way up to a 17-year-old boy. I have three girls, seven boys. Okay. And so it's a boy that is your oldest. Yes. So, I mean, just to be honest, I mean, a lot of moms listening to this are immediately picturing chaos and, you know, one kid is not listening, one kid's climbing up the walls and uh, mess everywhere, whatever. Is that a fair or unfair stereotype of big Christian families? Oh, I think it's an unfair stereotype. Yeah. I think that it's possible for there to be chaos with one child and not homeschooling, right? I mean, you can have chaos depending on whether you have systems in place in your home. And Honestly, on any given day, it could be more chaotic than others. But I think what people would be surprised to see if they came into the home of many of the friends that I have that have larger families in homeschool is a lot more order and a lot more, I would say, probably cooperation. I think one of the big things that you have to emphasize 
in any home, honestly, my mom emphasized this for us, and I only have one brother. People always assume I must have come from like 20 kids if I'm having 10 kids, right? Um, but she would emphasize for this, this for us that we would work together, that we had responsibilities in the home, that we weren't just kind of freewheeling through life with nothing to contribute. And I really appreciated that because I, I like knowing that I'm contributing something meaningful. So we do the same for our kids. You're contributing something meaningful. You live here. You are able to help each other. Our, our family motto is be a blessing. Mm -hmm. And we always say that that starts with each other. So of course, be a blessing to the person you see at the store. But if you're being a blessing to the person that you see at the store and you're being a jerk to your sister, that's hypocritical. Like, let's start at home, right? So it's not that there's never chaos, but I wouldn't say it's the norm. Okay. And how would you describe your and your husband's Christian beliefs? We are Bible-believing Christians who believe that the Word of God is sufficient. Basically, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit has given us all that we need for life and godliness, and that God's Word is living and active and powerful. And so we are basing our entire belief system on what Scripture informs and then on the Holy Spirit's kind of bringing that to life in our lives. So we go to a Reformed Baptist church, but I would call myself neither Reformed nor Baptist. Really? Yes. Wait, why? Because I don't like labels. Okay. Because I don't like putting God in a box. Because I don't believe that theology, which is so important, should trump relationship mm. and maybe not individual revelation, but because I think you can get really sticky with like, well, God revealed to me this and, and it doesn't match up with what you say. Therefore, you know, I know better than you. You can have a lot of infighting that way, but that the focus should be on adherence to scripture and our church preaches biblical truth. And so there we are. And it has a community of believers that are serving each other and they're being the hands, of feet, hands and feet of Jesus to each other in their community. So there we are. Um, there are some denominations that I would shy away from because as a general rule, they have walked away from biblical Christianity. They've become progressive. They've gotten beliefs that are antithetical to scripture. And so I really wouldn't like even shout out that particular denomination probably because of the associations. But yeah, Reformed, Baptist, sure. But first and foremost, I am a Christ follower who believes this holy word. You are a best-selling author. You have two books now. Emma's for Mama, A Rebellion Against Mediocre Motherhood, and Hard is Not the Same Thing as Bad. Two of the most popular parenting books in the gentle parenting genre are called Good Inside and No Bad Kids. What do you think about this belief that all children are good inside? Well, I can see how it would be easy to go there from a secular perspective. But if we're, because from a humanistic perspective, if there is no God, then there's not necessarily any absolute truth. There's no objective truth. Kind of you see this kind of soupy, my truth is my truth, your truth is true truth, do whatever you believe, whatever feels good. I was just having a conversation with some friends the other day um, at the gym, and neither one of them are professing believers. And that was kind of the basis of their quote unquote truth was like, well, I just feel good when I do this. Yeah. So there, and I was asking them questions like, yeah, well, how'd you push back on that? Well, I asked questions like, so what if doing harmful things to other people makes me feel good? Mm -hmm. well, well, no, no, not in that case. You know, and you have to say, where is the line drawn? Because as humans, if we're the ones drawing the line, everybody's drawing crisscrossing lines. But if we say, God is the source of ultimate truth, all truth is God's truth, then we have to then say, what is God's truth? Well, it's revealed in his word. And his word very clearly states, Romans 5, through Adam, sin entered the world, and it entered all of humankind. I've actually looked up that word for humankind that it uses there. It says man, but it doesn't just mean one gender. It doesn't mean someone who is of a particular age or maturity. It means every human is affected by the fall. And so my response to that is, as a secular humanist, I understand why you would want to make those claims. As a biblical Christian, I have to stand against those because they're not true. In March of this year, EWG reported on a new study that found a concerning amount of forever chemicals in our water, largely being attributed to our toilet paper. I think we forget sometimes that whatever we flush down the toilet ends up in our water supplies. And then we're like, why is the top water so bad? And then we're flushing the chemicals down the toilet. It's like this whole like little circle effect. Okay, this is why I want to introduce you to Bumroll, a premium eco-friendly toilet paper. Forever chemicals 
aka PFAS, are among the most persistent toxic compounds in existence. They contaminate everything from drinking water to food and personal care products. According to the EWG, even very low doses of forever chemicals in drinking water have been linked to the suppression of the immune system, an elevated risk of cancer, increased cholesterol, and reproductive and developmental harm. So if you're drinking it and it's bad, putting it on super absorbent areas of your body is also going to be bad. Yes, I'm talking about limiting your skin's exposure as much as possible, and that will make a difference. Bum roll toilet paper is 100% recycled, free of chlorine, free of perfumes, free of PBA, and free of plastic wrap. I also love that they help support American jobs in the USA by manufacturing here in America. That's not all. For every box they sell, they also donate to plant a native tree in the USA. And as you know, trees are the life source for us to breathe clean air since they absorb all the carbon in the air and release precious oxygen that we need every second of the day. Support businesses committed to being made in America that are also limiting your family's exposure to toxic forever chemicals. Use coupon code ALEX to get $3 off your first shipment by going to join bumroll.com. That's B-U-M-R-O-L-L.com. I've been loving switching to bumroll knowing that I'm doing good by myself and my local water supply. That is coupon code Alex to get $3 off your first shipment by going to joinbumroll.com. Joinbumroll.com, coupon code Alex to get $3 off your first shipment. Joinbumroll.com, coupon code Alex, or find the details in the show notes. What does the discipline strategy look like in your home? I think one of the biggest things that I talk about in Emma's for Mama is this idea that we are called to train our children. There's a verse in Ephesians 6-4 that's talking about fathers not exasperating their children. And that's actually a really popular verse that's referenced in the gentle parenting community, that we're not supposed to exasperate our children, we're not supposed to frustrate them with our erratic behavior, completely agree. But what tends to be left off is the rest of the verse, which is, but train them up in the teaching and admonition of the Lord. Interesting. I feel like there's so much in gentle parenting that they pick and choose little things and then they leave out huge tenets that would really be a part of Christian parenting. Well, and I don't think that that's unique to gentle parenting. I think that any parenting philosophy, which ends up sort of elevating itself above scripture. So I think that gentle parenting often is a pendulum swing against really harsh authoritarian parenting. And so if we're talking about this pendulum swing away from obey me without question, I don't care how you feel, then it makes sense that you would be going towards all feelings are valid and let's just find the verses in the Bible that say that all feelings are valid and we should be kind and gentle, right? And let's ignore the training part because the training part left me traumatized, you know, in some cases. So I think that we don't need to come down hard specifically on gentle parenting only and say, oh, look at them cherry picking all those verses. They're not really biblical. We can do that from a harsh perspective. We can do that from a permissive perspective. Say like, oh, well, the Bible doesn't exactly tell me that I have to follow through on everything. Well, no, you could find a couple of verses maybe that might support you in being a wild and free parent, but most of it is telling you to, and you were asking about our discipline philosophy, be consistent, be clear in your expectations, and be faithful in your follow through. Mm. So, Methodology, we can get into more later, but any kind of willy-nilly parenting is going to produce chaos, and we are called to produce peace in our homes. I just, you know, as somebody who doesn't have kids yet, it's like I keep seeing this with people I follow on Instagram or Instagram bloggers talking about gentle parenting or conscious parenting. And so the more I looked into it, I was just looking at this as a Christian. I'm like, okay, it's obvious to me. There is nothing biblical about this philosophy. Are Christians falling through the trap of interpreting theology through psychology? Oh, absolutely. But I want to back you up just a little bit and say, I don't believe that every tenet of gentle parenting is anti-biblical. Okay. I think that there are aspects to it that absolutely sound so appealing because they line up with Ephesians 4.32, which says, be completely humble and gentle, bearing with one another in love. 
the whole chapter of Ephesians is addressing like how we deal with our anger and not sinning and using wholesome words to talk to people. It's wonderful parenting advice as well as just person to person advice, right? I mean, parenting is person to person, but adult to adult. And so I think it's really easy to latch on to fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. Man, I like all of these. And then the last one is what? And I do not think that any good writer ever leaves the last one to the last because he doesn't want to emphasize it. What is all of that wrapped up in? Self-control. So we see an emphasis on those first fruit, and then we see sometimes a lack of emphasis on the need for that last part. So I do think certain aspects of gentle parenting are that the goal is good. The heart of it is to seek to acknowledge our children and to give them respect as image bearers in Christ and to be gentle with them when they see maybe aspects of their own upbringing that were not gentle and kind, right? That yeah. knee-jerk reaction, that pendulum swing again. Um, so when you're saying like, you're concerned about this, yes, I am concerned about this because I do think exactly what you said, that the Bible is being interpreted through the lens of psychology, which can be helpful. I'm not here to say that all psychology is from the devil or anything like that. Psychology, in its honest forms, is an examination of the way God made the human brain, right? But if we don't acknowledge the creator, if we don't acknowledge the designer first, yeah, and acknowledge that his truth always trumps his big T truth, always trumps little T truth, because the Bible is so clear It says, who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him for from him and to him and through him are all things to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So when we start looking at psychology to glorify man's wisdom, and the Bible so clearly tells us that man's wisdom is foolishness to God, we've got a problem. Is there a problem with Christian moms idolizing a certain parent style? 100%. 100%. Like, or even just anything like, well, we're a homeschool family. Like everything is homeschool. 100%. Or, or things like that. Yeah. I think if you are finding your identity in anything other than Christ, again, you have a problem. And you're going to be getting off in some direction or another. Either you're going to be diving into legalism, which is a form of abuse, or you're going to be veering into this sort of child-centric humanism, which can be another form of abuse. And I will tell you why I say this. In Matthew 18, it says that it would be better for someone to have a millstone tied around their neck and be thrown into the sea than to cause one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble. Like strongest language. Jesus is painted as being this nice guy, but we see some of the things that he says are so extreme. And so, well, how is gentle parenting or how is even... um, you know, really strict parenting. How is that tying a millstone around our child's neck? On the stricter side, and I know gentle parents right now are saying, it's not that I'm not strict. Maybe they don't like the word strict, but but I have boundaries. That's a really big thing that I get pushed back on. I'm not saying you don't have boundaries. However, if we're going to the extreme form of a tyrannical view, we are not correctly conveying the heart of God to children. Okay, so this is interesting that you're bringing this up because this is something that really stood out to me when I was looking into this too and in what gentle parenting really believes. So they focus on a lot of the positive attributes of Jesus, but they leave out what I would say are the full characteristics of God, like justice, for example. Yeah. Why do you think that's problematic? Well, it's it's the end of the sentence that I was just saying, which is that when we don't correctly do this incredible thing that God has given us the privilege to do as parents, which is be an example of him to our kids. So we as parents are the only physical representations of God the Father that our kids are going to see in some ways. In other words, we should be mirroring the attributes of God, right? If we swing this far over here and only mirror his wrath and his justice and his anger and his discipline, we are tying the millstone of legalism around our kids' necks. And that's kind of like that Bill Gothard, Duggar type of thing. Shiny, happy people type of thing. Yeah. 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 And then if we swing way over here, and we focus instead on the child's autonomy and the inherent goodness of the child to the exclusion of God's justice and the fact that he does use discipline to teach his children because he loves them, not because he hates them, right? Then we are tying the millstone of self-focus and 
a lack of a knowledge of a need for a savior around our kids' necks. And the last thing in the world that I want to do is either convey God is only angry, which is not true, or only merciful, which is not true. We want to marry those two into a balanced biblical approach to conveying the attributes of God to our children. Now, here's something I found out that was really juicy. (laughs) The founder of Gentle Parenting, her name is Sarah Ockwell Smith. She has on her website that this parenting philosophy is for everyone. Now, this is how she describes that. She said, atheists, Christians, Muslims, pagans. She says, religion is irrelevant. So is age, she says, sexuality, gender identity, and political leaning. So off the bat, The creator of this parenting philosophy is telling you that this parenting advice isn't coming from God's word, that it is a belief system. And so if you're not a Christian, I was was telling you this before we started, if you're not a Christian, then I guess that doesn't matter to you and you're like, who cares? But if you are a Christian, isn't all of that information a red flag? It's a huge red flag. And, um, I think we said before the podcast started that even if you're not a Christian, it should matter to you. Why? Because we look at the systems in our world that are based on the presumption that man is basically good. Let's take Marxism, for example. I know I'm speaking to a conservative audience. I don't think there's going to be too many people here that are cheering yay Marxism, right? Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Or socialism. It's based on the assumption that man is basically good, that humankind is going to do what's right when presented with the opportunity to do so. And yet, and therefore we're all going to share and we're going to be nice and everything is going to go well. And then we look at the fruits of that and it's not good at all. It in fact turns into communism, which has been the demise of millions upon millions of people. And while I'm not drawing a direct correlation to gentle parenting and saying you're going to be the demise of your children and millions and millions of people at yes, all. Yes, you are, because we want that for the clip. <laughs> and as for mama says, <laughs> just kidding. So I, I, we're, I don't, I'm not a fan of broad extrapolation. I'm not a fan of confusing causation with correlation. However, I am a fan of saying God's truth trumps man's truth. And that sounds like man's truth right there, for sure. How does this concept of gentle parenting being this democratic style, that's what they say, it's democratic. How does that directly undercut God's authority, that that authority structure that is so well laid out in scripture? Well, there's this invitation within gentle parenting for this dialogue with your kid at all times, right? About everything. It's supposed to be collaborative. Collaborative, right. Um, And if we are supposed to be mirroring the character of God, I'm just going to say that I don't remember the last time God asked for my advice on how to run the world, okay? Now, I, as a parent, am not running the world. However, I really believe that we do our children a disservice when we collaborate with them so much that we abdicate our authority. The fact of the matter is that a two-year-old is not developmentally able to make the decisions that will keep him from running into the road, that will keep him from eating only sugar all day long, that will keep him from having a rager till 2 a.m. every single night, and he's not gonna be better off for it. So that's an example of things that dental parents would agree with because they do make exceptions for this collaborative process usually when it comes to danger and when it comes to physical well-being. And I appreciate that. I think that's logical. But I do think we then have to extrapolate that into emotional areas. We have to extrapolate that into decision-making areas that our kids really are not mentally or emotionally developed enough to have proper input into. It's not that I don't ask them their opinion. It's that it is weighted with the understanding that I, the parent, am ultimately responsible for their well-being spiritually and otherwise now let me let me make a caveat there i can't save my kids i'm not responsible for their spiritual well-being in t- in the sense of salvation but i am responsible in deuteronomy 6 6 through 8 with impressing upon them what god has done and what his rules and what his commands are when they sit lie stand and walk 
what, what part of the day am I not telling them about the goodness of God and what he requires of this? That's like everything, right? Well, and so many things in the Bible, they are commandments. They're not suggestions. Right. Like, hey, you know, if you want, you should go here. You should do this. Um, it, it, it's, that's just not even how God speaks to us. And, and another tenet of gentle parenting is this leading through empathy, give choices, not commands, um, that parents need to emphasize with their children. They need to acknowledge their feelings. They need to give validation and support no matter the circumstance. Okay. So there's going to be some very practical hiccups with that, especially if you have more than one or two children. If I were to walk through the entire process that I've seen laid out in some of the gentle parenting articles that I've read with all of my children at all times in all of the interactions that we have each and every day, I'd probably spend my entire day validating and empathizing. Yeah. And we have to homeschool and we have to do dishes and we have to run errands and we have to get to play dates and we have to go to church and we have to, you know, I mean, we have deadlines, all the things. Hear me when I say that I am a big fan of learning my children's hearts, of paying attention to them, of loving them well and being kind to them. I had a reader one time message me that said something like, Uh, why aren't you a gentle parenting proponent? And I laid out some of the things we've been talking about. It doesn't line up with the whole canon of Scripture. It uses bits and pieces, but it ignores some of these other kind of areas where we talk about discipline, we talk about punishment, we talk about God's heart for justice, we talk about the ability that he has to be righteously angry and all of those things. And she said, yeah, but, but the focus is on paying attention to your children well and loving them well. And I said, that's not gentle parenting. That's good parenting. Like, we can't co-opt one aspect of, of good parenting practices, put a label on it, and then take it away from other parents. Gentle parents wouldn't like it if we did that to them either. You know, Nobody likes to be painted with broad strokes. But I think it's really easy in any area of life, but parenting is a big one, to feel like you have discovered the thing that fixes all of the problems. There's, there's also this like massive respect component yeah. where parents are told to respect their children as they want to be respected. But if that's the case, you would be treating children as adults. And that seems stupid to me because, I mean, to be honest, we're talking about kids who don't have brains that are fully formed yet. So like I'm, I, that immediately makes me think, okay, we're supposed to be respectful and, you know, listen to what a child is saying to you, respect them as you'd want to be respected. Well, then doesn't that lead to like, we get into these areas uh, or ideology of like, well, uh, my child is telling me that, you know, they're this different gender. Well, whatever they say is best. I want to respect them. I want to affirm them. I mean, so much of this affirm every emotion, respect their opinion stuff. I can just see the slippery slope. And I don't think you're wrong. I think that, again, as we learn the heart of our children, we will start to become experts on what they love, what they're interested in, what makes them tick. And those are all really good things. So the concept of giving a child choices, the concept of giving a child input, the concept of respecting their preferences when it is a non-moral issue or a non-mess-up-the-entire-family-dynamic issue. In other words, when the world won't revolve around them and make everybody else's lives miserable because I'm respecting their choice. That's, we've got to teach our kids that they live in a wider world, right? We've got to teach them that empathy doesn't just come toward them, but that they should offer empathy and interest in others to other people. So then if I'm going to be respectful to this child in these certain areas, I, the mom who am the authority, have the ability to discern the boundaries, to say, hey, listen, it doesn't really matter which shirt you wear, but you've got a whole drawer and it's going to take us an hour to go through the whole drawer. Here's your two options. That's a non-moral issue. That gives my child some agency. It helps them learn how to make decisions. Those are good things. But you're right that if the concept is absolute, then it starts going to the next thing, which is, no, I will not eat vegetables, to the next thing, which is, Uh, I don't really think that I was born this gender to the next thing, which is I reject all of the ideologies that you have raised me with completely because I have been told in some ways that I am my own God. Mm. Ooh, that's going to prickle people. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, well. 
never had an actual skincare routine but have always wanted to start one, dermatologists recommend starting with three simple steps with products that you love to get the most benefits. And the three steps that they recommend are to cleanse, treat, and moisturize. Well, it just so happens that one of my favorite skincare brands, Nimi Skincare, is inexpensive, conservative-owned, made in America, actually works, and has several three-step routines to choose from based on your skin concerns. Nimi Skincare has a three-step hydrate and protect line, daily glow-up line, and a three-step anti-aging line. The hydrate and protect line from Nimi is the Mac Daddy. And if you want more than three steps, you can go the extra mile. You'll get Nimi's vitamin C cleanser, their AM peptide cream, transforming eye cream, and Nimi's brightening daily protection SPF. All Nimi skincare is handmade, paraben-free, and uses clinically proven ingredients, including hyaluronic acid, peptides, AHAs, vitamin C, and 5% of Nimi's profits go to American causes that support women and girls. With a conservative and Christian-owned company, you can feel good about what your money is supporting and building in our communities. Everyone wants to know my skincare secret. I always tell them, it's Nimi. I just did a news hit the other day, and I kid you not, the producer afterwards was like, great job. By the way, before we disconnect, I have to know what you use for your skin because you absolutely glow compared to other guests. First of all, that made my whole day. But... You can have the same type of compliments. Become a glow getter, girl. NimiSkincare.com with code Alex Clark for 10% off. That's N I M I Skincare.com with code Alex Clark for 10% off. NimiSkincare.com with code Alex Clark for 10% off. Find the link in the show notes. I think one of the things that I really get a little bit leery of is the fact that it's really hard to find, as in I don't personally know of anyone that practices a the full gamut of the gentle parenting philosophy. I know people that do bits and pieces, but practices it faithfully according to what the philosophy says it believes, that has children who are adults. And one of the tenets of gentle parenting is that it raises more well-rounded adults than other kinds of parenting. So if we're doing that scientific neuroscience approach, we have to be able to prove this, right? And so the vast majority of the mamas that I see on social media leading the charge for this, not all, I'm not making this overarching claim that this is always true, but the vast majority are under 35, have one to two children, and the children are six and under. So we we haven't seen the fruit yet. We just haven't. And so those claims have to be examined under the light of scripture. Well, and when you look at these gentle parenting blogs and everything, it's like so much of the time, it seems like they are really using the the term respect as like a synonym for equality. Yeah. And, and when you're taught, that's where I, I get nervous about like, are children and adults equal? Should they be equal? In value, yes. yes. Yes, that's exactly what I was about to say. We are all image bearers. They are 100% equal in value. They are not equal in the responsibility for the decisions that they make. Yeah. Yeah. If they make some squirrely decision, guess who's responsible? Me, because I'm the authority. And so they're not equal in responsibility. They're not equal in consequences. They're not equal in commission by God, I don't believe, because he has made them the child. He has not made them the parent. And we have to acknowledge that that position was given to us by God, not by man. Well, this all just seems like very humanistic framework too. And so I'm just like, why as a Christian do you see that and think, hey, this is going to be a good idea. If your main goal as a parent is to lead your child to Christ, why would you use a secular parenting philosophy? So I'll give you a couple of examples of this. And I'll, I'll back up and start with this. I talked to quite a few people before I came on this podcast, just in my general community, and use the term gentle parenting. And if they were over 35 and they weren't on social media, they had no idea what I meant. They were like, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Then you explain some of the tenets, and if they're a biblical Christian, they start going, whoa, whoa, what about sin nature? What about a parent's responsibility to train up their child? What about authority? What about respect? What about honor your father and mother? Because this is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Like, where do those things? And I'm like, exactly. So these, these things started coming up. So I think there's an aspect of social contagion that we're talking about. Wait, so then, so that was what happened when you asked the the older women, and then what happened when you asked under 35 what they thought of gentle parenting? So I don't actually have a lot of people in my community that are on social media a lot that are just like my my in real life friends. But it, what I see, 
I have a Q&A that I do every single Wednesday called What Do You Want to Know Wednesday? And I get questions about gentle parenting every single week. What do they the, say? Um, a lot of it's discipline questions. A lot of it's, is it biblical? Could you give me an example of why not? Give me a list of scriptures. And that's another thing, is I see people wanting to be spoon-fed scriptural wisdom on gentle parenting, but not wanting to do the research themselves, or at the very least, not knowing where to start. So if they're under 35, especially under 30, there's just tons of chatter about like, this is the right way to go. Is this the right way to go? Is this the only way to go? Because I think when we see a, a philosophy that's being revisited and piled upon and talked about and trumpeted as kind of the only way to go, you got all these moms that start to question themselves. And they say, like, well, I must be doing it wrong. They're, uh, like, what? And you, you've got a panic going on among young moms who are wondering if they have somehow warped their child <laughs> for life. Doesn't this all kind of contradict children obey your parents for this is right? So interestingly enough, one of the responses I've gotten online from a gentle parent has said, well, that is a command to children, not to parents. Let that sink in for a moment. So then you have to ask yourself, uh, okay, but my three-year-old can't read. And if, and if Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 8 says, talk about God's ways when you sit, lie, stand, and walk, then clearly I am being tasked, train up your child in the way you should go, right? It's in Proverbs. I am being tasked with conveying God's commands to my children, right? That, that's in the Bible over and over again. So if they say that's to kids, not to parents— then you can turn around and say, but clearly, since I'm the one that has the mental maturity to understand it, then I'm the one that has to convey it. And there will come a point when they are mature enough and old enough to read it for themselves, in which case they will have to internalize that as a command from the Lord, because it is. Should children have a choice on if they should obey or not? Absolutely. And if they, they should, should have a choice to obey? Yes. And if they don't obey, their choice is a consequence. Okay. I mean, that is what we are choosing. Old Testament talks all the time about the fact that God is a God of blessing and cursing. I will bless those who bless me. I will curse those who curse me. Listen, Israelites, here's what I need you to do. I need you to obey my laws. I need you to not follow after other gods. I need you to worship me only. I need you to adhere to these things and treat foreigners this way and dress this way. And it all seems like too much, except that his response to that is, I will be your God and I will lead you and I will bless you. But if you do not... If you turn away from me, if you follow other gods, if you take on these other inferior practices, if you choose to be a pagan and act like I am not your king and your God, I will curse you. And we see the, the culmination of that in prophecy when Babylon takes all of Israel off into exile and God never went back on his promise. That is what happened to Israel. And so that's a really like, like concrete example. But we see this again laid out in the New Testament as well. We're in Hebrews in 11, oh, or is it 12? I think it's 11. It talks about um, the fact that God disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son it, or chastises or scourges. Like it's strong language. So it's not all about respect, empathy, and kindness. Some of it is we learn through consequences. I mean, I found this to be true in my life. Yeah. If I go up to a hot stove and I touch it, I'm going to get burned and I'm going to learn not to do it again because it was painful. And the rest of Hebrews says no discipline is, is fun at the time. It's not pleasant. But in the end, it produces a harvest of righteousness for those who are willing to be trained by it is what it says. Yes. I have some questions about that, about that very thing. Um, okay. So do you know who Elizabeth Elliot is? Absolutely. All right, well, she's one of my favorite people of all time. And like, you know, when people are like, if you could have dinner with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? She would be my person. Um, but what I really like is that her family or organization or whatever they've done in honor of her, they have like found, I don't know if you've noticed this um, or seen this before, but she has a podcast. Yeah. yeah so they like find all of her old talks and yeah. stuff that's been recorded and they release them as podcasts. So it's funny that we're doing this episode right at a time where she just released or they released on behalf of her, 10 recordings of about discipline. Okay. Um, and so she says that as soon as your child is crawling, 
you are teaching your children delayed obedience if you count to three or you count to 10. Um, she believes that's a mistake. And she believes that once they're crawling, think about how little that is, only a few months old, once they are scooting and crawling around, you should only say no one time. And if they do not listen and they still reach for, you know, the tea towel that's going to break dishes or whatever they're doing, and you say no and they don't listen, that they deserve a swat on the hand. What do you think about that? I think that's extreme, honestly. And I don't think that that works practically with every single type of behavior and every single type of child and every single type of crawling baby. Like, yeah, I, I honestly... Elizabeth Elliot had one child. That's very important to point out. Yeah, and I'm not saying she wasn't a good parent, um, but I do think we see her generation showing mm. in that claim. I think that that you wouldn't necessarily be able to find that anywhere in the Bible, that when you've got a crawling child and they have done something that they're not supposed to do and they don't obey you immediately, that you give them a swat. I don't find that to be biblically necessarily accurate. And Elizabeth Elliot is one of my favorite people too. However, she's not God. And she's not the Bible. So we always have to, what I'm encouraging everyone to do in this episode over and over again is to shine the light of scripture on your belief system. And if it exposes darkness, get rid of it, you know? And so what I would say to that is not necessarily, oh, that's darkness. Oh, she was trying to abuse her children. But instead that she maybe was taking it to an extreme. Let me give you this example from the Bible. There's a parable of two sons, Okay. This is about salvation, but I think you can extrapolate it towards discipline. So the father says to one son, go and do this bidding that I give you. The son says, I will not, and he goes away. But later on, the Bible says that he repents, and I think that word is so important. It wasn't just that he changed his mind or that he thought that it would be more advantageous to him to obey his father and therefore have his father on his good side, or that someone came along and convinced him, although maybe somebody else was involved, we don't know, from the parable, he repented. And you know what he did? He obeyed his father. And the idea is for salvation, you're talking about someone who is straight from God, who has run from God, who has rejected God, but comes to salvation eventually. And that person is saved. We think about the thief on the cross that's right beside Jesus. And he says, Today you will be with me in paradise, even though that man had known him for five minutes, you know? And Jesus says, my blood has covered you as well. I'm putting words in Jesus' mouth, but that's essentially what he's telling him. And then there's, a, there's another son in that parable that says, oh, yes, Father, I will do what you ask. But he doesn't. And Jesus says to his disciples, which one of these two men obeyed his father? And they mm. say, the first one. So I do think that there is a lot of benefit to conveying to your children that you mean what you say the first time. But I also think, especially with small children, that we have to take into account their developmental status, which yeah. is so many of the things that they're doing are learning language. Yes, the short syllable no, they understand, but they might not quite understand what you're saying no to, or they might not even hear you exactly. I have found this to be true of some of my children because with 10 kids, as you can imagine, I have quite the array of personalities and preferences and character traits and just all the things, right? I did not birth 10 compliant, calm children. <laughs> <laughs> I've had some that were more that way and have some that were spicy as can be. And when you're talking about what you can do to know the heart of your children and to convey to them the heart of God for me and for you, which is he loves us so much. And it says that our tears are put in a bottle, not literally, but it's the idea. He cares about what we care about, and he he weeps with us, right? And our, our names are graven on his palms, and he cares about the sparrow, and he cares about the grass of the field. This is not an aloof God. This is a loving God who loves us enough to discipline us when we do wrong so we won't do it again, and we'll, we will follow and love him, right? And so if I'm going to say to a child that I know has trouble focusing and hearing me and is wholly involved in his brain flakes or his magnetiles— don't do that. And then I punish him or give him a consequence when he didn't hear me the first time. I don't think that's a accurate conveying of the character of God, which again is always going to be my goal. So how many times do you think it's okay to like ask your child to do something? So I think one of our responsibilities as parents is to make sure that they've heard us. 
And I have a couple of toddler podcasts where I talk about this. And one of the things that I will do with my toddlers that have trouble hearing me the first time or are really distracted is I will come to them and listen, this is more work as a parent, but that's part of laying down our lives for our children, which is the example of what Jesus did for us, right? We are supposed to be completely humble and gentle bearing with one another in love, and that includes our children. So I'm going to take the extra step of going to my four-year-old and saying, Shiloh, can you look mom, mom in the eyes? And I get his attention, and that may take a second, and I don't think it's disrespectful for it to take a second. Um, I'm going to ask you to do something. And when I ask you to do it, I need you to say, yes, ma'am, mama. And someone's going to say, oh, you're already, requiring dis you're already requiring obedience before he even knows what it is. Well, it's because I, as a loving parent, know that I'm about to ask him to go potty, and he hasn't gone in two hours, right? He doesn't like going potty. Wait, I, this is new to me. Are you not supposed to require obedience before you tell a child what it is? Um, and gentle parenting, no, because you're not supposed to require blind obedience. Oh, so they need okay. to like hear the entire proposal before they decide whether they're going oh, to obey, right? Um, because it's a collaborative process, and I haven't collaborated with Shiloh yet, right? Okay. So I go to Shiloh, and, and I get down on his level, and I say, hey, I'm about to ask you something. And this may sound like extra, and I've had, I haven't had to do this with all of my kids, but I know my Shiloh well, and he needs to have his attention taken away from his lizard. He's obsessed with reptiles. <laughs> He brings them in the house that was not all the what time. I was expecting oh you to say. no, frogs, lizards, bugs. He's obsessed. So <clears throat> that's that has his whole attention and adoration, right? So I come and I say, Hey Shiloh, and listen to me. The reason I'm doing this extra step is because I know him well enough to know if I just say, Shiloh, go potty for me, please, he's going to stiffen up and get frustrated that he has to abandon his toy, the thing that he loves, right? And I will say, hey, I'm about to ask you to do something. I need you to say, yes, ma'am, mama, and go do it. Then you can come right back to your lizard. And he's looking at me and he says, okay, mama. And I say, I need you to go potty for me, please. And he runs off and he goes potty. He doesn't like wasting his time doing that, right? But I, as his mother, know that he's going to get a bladder infection if he doesn't, right? Yeah. Or have an accident. So Elizabeth Elliot might think that that was pretty frou frou -y, And I went through a lot of extra steps. But when I'm talking about conveying the character of God who loves us and cares about the details of our lives, to our children so that they understand him as a loving God and we are, we are kind of representing him correctly in biblical truth. I think that we need to know who we're dealing with and certain kids will respond differently. Is the way that you asked your kids to do certain things a different style now after 10 compared to when you had two? Yes and no. I always tell people that my hardest parenting years, and I will say this to the camera, my hardest parenting years as a mother were when I quote unquote only had two kids and they were not developmentally able to do much of anything because you just don't know if anything you're doing is quote unquote working. Like, right. dude, are you ever going to wipe? Are you ever going to buckle? <laughs> your so then they get a little older. You're like, okay, wait, I'm all right. I can breathe. They're yes, not crazy. I can breathe. I can breathe. I have seen the fruit of my labor, you know? And so to some extent, I'm way chiller than I was with my first two. I mean, those first ones are always your guinea pigs. Yeah. And you're thinking, man, this is not gonna go well. I've got to do everything perfectly. And I will say back on topic to the gentle parenting, I see a lot of fear-based parenting and gentle parenting because I get messages from moms all the time that are terrified they're going to developmentally mess up their child. The amount of times that I saw the word trauma when I was looking over gentle parenting content for this podcast, everything is trauma. You don't want your child to have trauma. like. Are it you know are they overusing that term? So I actually did a podcast with a friend of mine who's a biblical counselor. She's a licensed counselor who is a biblical Christian. I'll put it that way because there are different certifications. And the reason that I did that podcast is because of the big three T's that are being overused: trauma, triggers, and therapy. I know, I know. We just I'm did another. We in. just did another podcast, didn't we? Yeah. No, I'm like, oh, I have to go listen to this episode. And anytime I talk about this, people obviously are very triggered because of their trauma, and probably because they've gone to therapy, and they are upset at me for bringing this up. So, of course, I had to bring on an expert and say, "Do you believe that this is something that's a genuine phenomenon in our society?" What did she say? She said exactly what we're saying about gentle parenting. The pendulum has swung so far from take two Bible verses and feel better in the morning, which is kind of what we used to hear when it was like, don't talk about your issues. Jesus is enough. And hear me, Jesus is enough. But this concept that there aren't like practical things that we can do to help ourselves. Oh, everything's a pill. Well, no, she is a holistic counselor. She has a practice called Living Well. And 
she approaches things from like mind, body, soul. Right. So she's got massage therapy. She's got therapy. But that's therapy. what I'm saying. Like compare that to like uh, oh, right. typical, you know, psychiatrist or whatever. They're always going to refer you or a psychologist, you know, from a secular one. I feel like they're all just like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you need Xanax. Yeah. Or and, whatever. And it can be that way. But she's saying she's seeing this pendulum swing to everything is trauma. And, and I am genuinely triggered and no one dare question whether it is mislabeled perhaps in some cases or not because so many things have been ignored and she does think that the centering point is over here not over here with everything is trauma and so I really appreciated her biblically based perspective because she is dealing with people with genuine trauma she's dealing with people that she probably would say to me but not them that maybe don't have genuine trauma but she's still having to be gentle and caring to them while speaking biblical truth Conventional fruit juice in America is just as unhealthy as soda. Lots of parents making what they think is a healthier choice, giving their kids juice instead of pop. But if you're getting regular cranberry, grape, or orange juice from the grocery store, it could be loaded with corn syrup and ungodly amounts of sugar, dyes, and in 2019, Consumer Reports even found harmful levels of arsenic and lead in fruit juice. That's Fun, not. Here's your solution. Switch to squeezed juice. Squeezed juice makes five flavors of fruit juice made from a small, conservative-owned family farm in California, and everything they make is 100% juice, not from concentrate, non-GMO, no water added, fresh pressed and HPP pasteurized, with all the vitamins and nutrients intact so that the juice is actually healthy, not pretend healthy. Squeezed juice is the closest thing to squeezing your own fruit juice without the worst and it ships on non-toxic frozen ice straight to your door so it can go right into your fridge. That is how fresh it is. Squeeze Juice is truly a tree-to-bottle product. I love their pomegranate juice. The mandarin juice will make you feel some type of way. And they have three functional juices that offer special benefits, which is really great for custom ordering juice for your specific needs. Squeeze Juice's Power Juice is a green juice. It's got a blend of amazing ingredients like matcha, spinach, cucumber, and celery to power you through your day. The immunity juice is full of vitamin C with a kick of ginger, turmeric, and habanero pepper. Focus juice offers natural energy from a plant called guarana with a taste of beets and strawberries. And one 11 ounce bottle of the focus juice is equal to one and a half cups of coffee and so much better for you. Are you listening, Prego Cute Servatives? Go to shop.squeezejuice.com. Use code Alex for 25% off. Shop.squeezejuice.com with code Alex for 25% off. I know you're thirsty. Shop.squeezejuice.com with code Alex for 25% off. And if you forget, click the link in the show notes. Is it concerning to you that um, there's almost no mention of fathers in all these gentle parenting forums? It's all about the mother and it seems very female based. Yeah, I have noticed that. And what's interesting is when it tells fathers not to exasperate their children, we could extrapolate that to parents, but it's actually a command given to fathers because we are looking at fathers as the head of the household from whom trickles down this example. Another great example is in Timothy 3, I believe, and it talks about the requirements to be an elder or deacon, and it's saying that a father should manage his family well, should see that his children obey him. And man, I just revel some feathers because that's not what the current philosophy is wanting to hear. But the end of it is so good because it says, but do it in a manner worthy of respect. But that's what a dad is being called to do. That's not what the mom is being called to do. We are called to support and uphold and follow that example. Even if he's not a believer. Yeah, and you have obviously- Which is, is like, ooh, for Christians, even if your husband is not a believer, the Bible says you still submit to him and then through your actions, you hopefully- Yeah, you were, you were preaching the gospel to mm -hmm. him. And of course, what we're saying always is obey God, not man. Obey God, not man. And so clearly, if an unbelieving husband is exhorting a wife to do something that's ungodly, that's a moment of rebellion and not submitting, but otherwise, yeah. Another huge problem I have is, is this idea that all emotions are valid and need to be validated. If all of our emotions are valid and no one is guilty of sin, why need a savior? That is an excellent point. And I was referring to that podcast I did with my friend. And so it depends on what you mean. Let's define our terms. What do we mean by valid? 
Are all emotions valid in that I actually do experience them? Yes. Okay. So we're not going to invalidate and say, you aren't actually angry. That's that's gaslighting somebody, right? And we're, we don't want to do that. That's not kind. But then the next consideration is, okay, so it's valid because I actually experienced it. Sure, I'm, I'm on board with that. But is it valid as in it excuses my behavior that results from it? No, going way back to that Ephesians chapter four that I was talking about, it's all about your anger. In your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give the devil a foothold. I mean, again, really strong language, right? To say that like anger absolutely corrupts. Corrupts. The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Okay, I don't know the reference for that, but that's a paraphrase of scripture. So when we were talking, my friend Amy and I were talking about this, we were like, what we need to do is look at the two ends of the emotion. Let's say the emotion is in the center. It's existing. Let's call that neutral, okay? What underpins the emotion could absolutely be sinful. In other words, my emotion might be anger, but the anger might be resulting not from trauma or having been triggered, but from selfishness. Right. Eesh. And I have to be honest enough to say, you know what? I wanted the thing that that person got, and that's why I'm jealous. It's not because I was traumatized when I was five. There are instances in which that is true, you know? But then we go to the other side of that, Suppose, you know, let's call it neutral. We go to the other side of it, and then it's the actions. So you look at the heart of the thing, because Jesus said, Jesus says, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And he's not talking about speaking kind words. He's talking about every evil thing, you know? And so we look at this emotion. We say, it exists. God gave me emotions. God gave me feelings. Yeah. These are not wrong because God gave them to me. However, the motivation and the thing that caused the emotion and also the action that I then commit as a result of the emotion could absolutely be sinful. Well, the gentle parents want us to know that they are not anti-discipline. They're just anti-punishment. I've already quoted a verse that talks about the Lord disciplining those he loves and punishing every person that he calls his son, which means his child. Yeah. You're going to have a hard time looking at the whole of Scripture. In fact, there is this super spicy verse in Proverbs that says, if you hate your child, you will spare discipline or spare the rod, but he who loves his child will discipline him. So that is a form of punishment. We're not talking just about a correction. We're talking about something that's unpleasant. We're talking about that touching of the hot stove and jumping back and saying, oh man, that was so unpleasant. I don't ever want to do that again, right? So I do think that if you make that differentiation, but you can't back it up with scripture, that you're either going to have to go digging and find some scripture that's not cherry-picked, that matches all of the Old Testament and the New Testament, or you're going to have to concede that discipline shouldn't be pleasant. It shouldn't be something... I'll give you this example. Uh, my little boy, my toddler, pushed a stroller down the stairs. He was just pushing it uh, not bit, like two stairs on our front porch. But he's a little bitty guy. The stroller kind of pulled him down with it. He was pushing it on the front porch, and before he knew it, he had fallen down the stairs. We took him to urgent care, which was like two minutes from our house. And he was fine. He just had a bruised shoulder, but we were just making sure. And he got juice. He got like crackers. He got to color. He got undivided attention from mom and dad for like three straight hours. And I was like, are we reinforcing this behavior? I mean, obviously not intentionally, right? Yeah. So I'm not going to discipline my child for accidentally pushing a stroller down the stairs, but we don't want our response to ungodly behavior, to unrighteousness, to defiance, to rebellion, to be something that makes the child go, eh, I think the reward was better than the punishment. We want it to be something that actually does make them think, goodness, why would I ever do that again? Yeah. What, what is the biblical way to discipline a child who's throwing a tantrum or throwing fits? I think that's going to vary depending on the child. I am much less concerned about your specific methodology. For example, I have had different forms of discipline for different kids. Ooh, tell us some of those examples. Well, I will say this. The internet is a crazy and wild place, and I have no interest in anybody parenting Abby style. So I'm not really interested in being like, in this exact instance, with this exact personality, this is exactly what I do. I don't think that that's particularly helpful because people tend to want all day, every day, the questions that I get are, give me the exact solution to my exact problem. Yeah. And my answer is always maddeningly, moms are like, seriously, to turn it around and say, I'm going to convey to you a biblical principle 
and then you're going to have to do the hard work of applying <laughs> it. So I'm going to go way back to learn your kid's heart, learn their pain points in a, in a good way. I don't mean that in a sadistic way. I mean, if I have a child that doesn't give a flip about screen time, taking away screen time is not right. going to be an appropriate discipline for him, right? Yeah. If I've got a child who's an introvert who would love to stay home, Grounding saying you can't them. go to that party is not helpful at all. If I've got a child that loves to go to their bed and play with their stuffed animals, and I said, you have to sit on your bed, they're like, party! You know, that's not, I'm not knowing my child well to know what's actually going to be something that makes them sit up and listen. So my answer to that would be something that makes them sit up and listen, something that you can follow through on, in other words, if you promise a child at 8 a.m., we're talking a two-year-old that he doesn't get dessert after dinner because he does, like, child does not make the connection between the consequence and the behavior. And it's been like seven hours by the time you get to dinner and they don't remember what yeah. you promised them. Be a faithful parent that can follow through on what you promise your child you're going to do. And then be willing to show up every day and do it again. I have so many people that message me and they say, you know, I tried this thing that you suggested. It doesn't work. And I'll say, okay, so um, what didn't work about it? Well, it's been like three days and they're still doing it. And I, I'm not laughing like at them, but as someone who sometimes has had to work on behaviors, I had, I had a child that I, we lovingly call a rage monster. He just, things made him angry. He had some sensory issues. If he had crumply clothing, which was wrinkles, and I don't iron much, so there was always crumply clothing <laughs> at some point. He, he melted down. You know, we had to work with him proactively. Um, and it wasn't all about discipline, because I think that we do find those pain points and say, this is what makes you sit up and listen. But we are always marrying those with, I see you, I love you, I want your best good. I grew up with a mom that always told me, if I didn't love you, I wouldn't care what you did. But because I love you, I care very much, and we are not doing that. Now, you know, just because we're anti-gentle parenting, there's going to be a slew of comments saying, well, just admit that you love corporal punishment. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, I think that is a major hang-up. So you've got verses in the Bible, in Proverbs, like the one that I just said. Um, everybody always says, spare the rod, spoil a child, but that's not actually a biblical it's not found in the Bible, that exact verse. But you do have the verse that I told you earlier in Proverbs about if you, he who hates his son spares the rod, but he who loves his son disciplines him. And then you also have folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction drives it far from him. And so there's this huge debate. Is the rod literal? Is it figurative? Are we talking in metaphors? Or are we literally talking about a big fat stick? Like, what? how does this work? And I've seen both sides. And I will tell you that if my goal is to bring it back to the light of Scripture over and over again, and not what does Abby Halberstadt do, if I say, I don't spank, I've immediately lost half your audience. If I say, I do spank, I've lost the other half. And they're not going to listen to anything else I have to say, when instead what I want you to hear is methodology can vary. And I do think that the people that say spanking is definitely outright abuse are not going to find support for that in the Bible. And I do think that people say, unless you interpret the rod literally, are missing a step too, because there's pr some pretty good arguments for it being metaphorical. But anybody who says, we are never punishing, we are never chastising, we are never disciplining, we are never like responding to this strongly, is not getting the crux of what those... Bible verses are saying. Do you think any exhausted mom, once she's died and gone to heaven, you think she just like walked up to Jesus and she said, all right, tell me, was I supposed to spank or not? No, no. And here's why. Because every single one of these things we get so hung up on is going to leave our brains the moment we are in the presence of a holy God and praising him forever. We aren't going to care. And I'm not saying that discipline methodology never matters. I'm not saying this is willy-nilly. I'm not saying everything goes. However, I am saying that this is a topic that is best addressed with a one-on-one -on -one good godly mentor who has 
personal life experience and knows you personally. This is not a soundbite for the internet. Is there supposed to be some grand spiritual lesson every single time you discipline? Like, are you whipping out some sort of Bible verse, um, you know, when one kid is is hitting the other and then the other kid is going outside, you know, unsupervised? Like, when all these things are happening at once, one kid is fleeing in their poop. Like, what <laughs> should those discipline moments actually look like from a spiritual perspective? Like, when are you supposed to bring spiritual scripture in or, or are there times where it's like there is no time my kid is about to run into traffic um absolutely and i think there is a huge amount of grace for the very practical overworked stressed out mom moments okay like there is no way um have you ever heard the the song be careful little eyes what you see be careful little ears what you hear the rest of it is for the father up above is looking down with love it does matter what we see and hear and what we put in our minds. It does matter how we parent our children. But Jesus isn't looking at us saying, I'm going to squash you if you get this wrong. You'll be smited. Yeah, right. There are examples where the consequences are really painful, and they teach us that the heart of God is that he doesn't want us to do that again. He doesn't want us to go down a path of destruction. But in those moments of harried just please get out of the road, you know, and oh, I'm sorry, let, let me rephrase that. Get out of the road. As if I'm saying like, please, when my child is running into traffic, you know, I'm sprinting after them, hauling them up. And I have twin toddler, like little twinados, right? Twinados. <laughs> so they have both sprinted in opposite directions for different roads before. And your brain just goes, Lord, are you kidding? Like, what in the world? Yeah. And you, you do the best you can in that moment. Tell me about some like opportunities throughout a mom's day that are really good opportunities to talk about God. Okay, so we are a homeschool family, but I don't think that this is limited to homeschooling. We get up and get going with family Bible reading at 7.30 in the morning, something like that, which means all of our kids are participating in some way. Are the two-year-olds spouting Bible verses? No. Do I know some two-year-olds that spout Bible verses? Yes. They're not mine right now. Um, is the four-year-old perfectly still? No. Is the six-year-old standing on his head sometimes? Yes. But I think the faithfulness to lean into the squirreliness and be willing to do that Deuteronomy 6, talk about it when you sit, stand, lying on your head, you know, just whatever your daily life looks like, take the opportunity to talk about the Lord and his goodness and his righteousness and his holiness and his truth. And it it takes some practice. You have to kind of get your brain in gear to go outside and say, Shiloh, honor, look, look, look at that cloud. Like, do you know what kind of cloud that is? Talk about what kind of cloud it is and who made that? And how do we know that, that God made that? Because that's not going to form itself on its own. Like, that, that's by design. Isn't that so cool that God chose to put that dinosaur cloud in the sky? And so when you're talking about sit, stand, lie, and walk, all parts of your day. We start the day with family elaborating around 7.30. Sometimes it's really chill. Sometimes it's the opposite of chill. We push through anyway. As on a, it's not every single day, but as a general rule. Sean leads it now. There have been times when he been, he's been traveling a lot or his schedule didn't allow for it. What about like, I mean, you have teenagers. What about when a teenager's like, I do not want to do this. I want to sleep in. Like, I think, so our teens don't say that um, with their words. There are times that they come downstairs and they are <laughs> half asleep. And they're falling asleep on the couch because we all stayed up till 11.30 the night. Oh, not we all, but like mom and dad and the older kids stayed up till 11.30 the night before watching a movie. And we are like all dragging. And we're having to say, uh-uh, sit up, take your head off the pillow or whatever. But we have always strived to frame the goodness of God in very practical ways and his word in a very positive light. And so we don't get a lot of pushback on family Bible reading. Like no one is saying, eh, I don't want to. Again, with their words, there may be, and, and I, I haven't really gotten the impression that they don't want to, even with their actions or with their mental response that's framed on their face, but you can tell they're tired sometimes, yeah. you know, they may not be fully engaged. Sean does a really good job of asking questions. So he's not droning on in Leviticus. Like if we happen to be in Leviticus, Leviticus or Numbers, which are which are hard books to get through because there's a lot of little picky uni details, or um, Revelation, which is hard to understand. He's stopping. What about that part of Genesis where it's just like for like 20 years, it's just names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember Number, that Numbers too. Um, <laughs> so he is stopping and doing heart checks. He is stopping and asking comprehension questions. Another fun thing that we do 
uh, is that he writes down questions, sometimes obscure ones, on note cards. And then on Sunday nights, we have these buzzers, these like game night buzzers, and the kids buzz in and do Bible trivia that's unique to our family. It's based on the reading that we're doing, and they they beg for it. If it's Sunday night and we haven't gotten out the buzzers, they're like, come on, get the buzzers out. Um, we also have some components of homeschooling. So that talk about God's goodness and talk about his law and talk about scripture. So we have a series that we do with read alouds called Christian Heroes Then and Now. Elizabeth Elliot is one of them. Corey Timboom is one of them. George Mueller, Jim Elliott, Eric Little. You just go on and on through Heroes of the Faith. And they're so engaging. If you don't do Christian Heroes Then and Now with your kids, whether you're public, private, homeschool, do it. They will love it. And the kids of all ages get so much out of it. And it's just so cool to see examples of people that have gone before and been faithful. Yeah. Um, so that's another way. And there's so many fun things. I mean, we've been talking about Elizabeth a lot on this episode, but like even with Elizabeth, oh, well now we can look up, there's a whole lesson. This is not about gentle parenting at all, but as a side, that's so fun to be like, oh, well now let's look up, you know, where was it that Jim went? What was that, you know, huh. yeah. island yeah, or yeah, country yeah, or whatever? And then yeah. well, what did this culture believe? And yeah. I don't know. There's so many things that you can get into. What kind of plants live on this island? You know what I mean? And good literature. I yeah. mean, be, beyond that, we're always looking. Sarah McKenzie that does the Read Aloud Revival has this great quote, and I'm going to butcher it a little bit, but I'll try to get it close. She's talking about the fact that good literature is true. And the truth is that there is always hope. So she's not a fan of literature that ends in despair and hopelessness because oh, that's not the truth. She would hate my bookshelf. I'm a, I'm a thriller <laughs> horror girl through and through. <laughs> so she is advocating for teaching, especially young minds, the concept that hope always wins, even when there's tragedy, even when there's sorrow in this world, which Jesus has promised us this, there will be. In this world, you will have trouble. You will have hard things, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. That's what you're always conveying to your children. Like, not that it's going to be easy for you. Not that the discipline's going to be fun, but that Jesus never leaves you or forsakes you. Please, God, save me from the internet. This was my plea after watching some woman stick a drugstore tampon in her ground beef she was cooking to sop up grease. It was like an Instagram reel. Miss Ma'am, do you have any idea that you just willingly poisoned your family's dinner? She must not know what is actually in her cheapy drugstore tampons. This is why I get all my feminine products, my pads, my panty liners, and tampons from Garnu. Over 90% of the cotton produced in the United States has been genetically modified to be resistant to Roundup Weed Killer by using glyphosate. Cotton tampons may contain glyphosate, which is problematic because its long-term health effects in humans, well, isn't totally known. The World Health Organization recently ruled it as probably carcinogenic, but we don't really have a definitive answer yet, I have to say that. Well, guess what? The vagina, oh, she said vagina in an ad. The vagina is a highly permeable space. Anything we put inside can easily be absorbed through the mucous membrane and then right into our bloodstream. Zap! Chronic exposure increases our risk of cancer, causes oxidative stress and metabolic changes, and disrupts our endocrine system. Garnu makes 100% organic tampons, pads, and panty liners made without dyes, fragrance, chlorine, bleach. They have a paraffin emulsion for a water-repellent string, BPA-free bio-based applicator tube made from sugar cane, and biodegradable wrappers. Yeah, like, that was a lot to be like, dude, this is the most natural period product that you're going to get on the market, and also no glyphosate. Infertility, endometriosis, and thyroid disorders are all on the rise and are affected by exposures to chemicals and toxins in our environment. You know what? You got to ask yourself, do you know what your tampons and pads are made out of? Okay. You might be saving a dollar or two by getting whatever at Walgreens, but like Bro, what is the true cost? Garnu is conservative owned. They make products for girls only. Try Garnu pads or tampons with a one-time order or do the subscription, which is what I do. So I never forget. I am always ready for Strawberry Week when it comes. Each Garnu subscription supports feminine hygiene training and female entrepreneurship to Nepali women and girls who are vulnerable to human trafficking. So how cool is that? Go to Garnu.com. Use code Alex for 15% off. G A R. N-U-U.com with code Alex for 15% off. Organic tampons and pads. G-A-R-N-U-U.com code Alex for 15% off. Get the link in the description. Well, you just did something that most people would say you're certifiably insane for. You just took 10 kids to Europe. Yep. 
when you are traveling like that, especially to another time zone or another country, how do you manage discipline and obeying amidst jet lag, hours of traveling, you know, excitement of being somewhere new? So here's the thing. <clears throat> I don't have 10 two-year-olds. And I think a lot of people picture me taking 10 two to five-year-olds to Europe right? I have older children whom I have been investing in for years, who know the ropes, who could run the ropes, right? And they are genuinely helpful and they are genuinely able to physically carry bags. You should see the videos of my 17-year-old uh, toting a toddler around on his back all through France and all of these places. And he did that not because we required him to, but because I have a kind of janky back and he knows that. And so he actually voluntarily carried a toddler Aww. because he knew it would be, it's that whole idea of being a blessing, right? So he knew it would be a blessing to his mama to take that literal weight off my shoulders. And so that's one thing. We weren't traipsing through Europe with 10 two-year-olds. The other thing is you have a trickle-down effect from all of this work that you've been putting into the older kids in that you never want them parenting the younger kids. We are not into parentification. They are not ultimately responsible. They don't have the authority to tell their siblings what to do in like, oh, you know, get over there and do that. Mm -mm, not unless mama has said that that's what you need to do. However, if it's a principle in our home, then they do have the ability to remind. Like, you're not supposed to be doing that because we don't do that in this house. That's super helpful Yeah, to have that kind of example and um, the good attitude going into it. And then also, we didn't do this when we hadn't trained our kids for years. So huge amount of grace went into this trip. I would say that if it was six weeks. I would say five of those six weeks, the twin bees, Titus and Toby, that's our two youngest kids. We call them the twin bees. So we've got the twinsies, twin sisters, twin bees, twin brothers. And it just helps because you can't just say the twins, right? Um, the twin bees melted down over everything every single day. Like we had a fabulous trip. It was so good. But there were aspects of it that were really hard. Mm -hmm. And one of them was two toddlers at all times feeling a little bit discombobulated. You have to give them grace. You have to meet them where they are and understand that you just turn their world upside down. So sometimes it was a lot of song and dances from everybody. You know, everybody was pitching in to help keep the Twin Bees happy because they were the wild card in all of this. Yeah. And sometimes it wasn't so wild card. It was like, they're pretty much guaranteed to wake up grumpy and we're going to have to cheer them up and find the right snacks for them and all of those things. So the discipline aspect didn't start on the trip. It started years right. ago in laying the foundation of consistency and follow through. I like that. I like that advice is that this kind of stuff starts, you lay the foundation so that you can do this kind of exciting stuff later. Yeah. How should moms get through a tough season who might be really low on energy and stamina handle discipline? So like, you know, being pregnant and sick comes mm -hmm. to mind or they're going through a season of grief maybe. Mm -hmm. Have you ever gone through a difficult season in terms of discipline and what did God teach you in that season. Sure. So we have built a couple of houses and my husband is listening to this episode right across the room on this couch. And he's the one that did 95% of the work, he and his dad together. So when I say we built it like literally with our own hands, it's a stinking huge amount of work. It is a giant undertaking. It is really stressful. It is a huge commitment, right? And plus we're raising kids and we're homeschooling them. And so we have to be a team. That's so crucial. But of course, there are times when he's traveling or when he's working on the weekends. And I mean, a lot of times, especially when he's building the house, he wasn't home a ton. Or when he was home, it was doing his day job. So it's all me. And as someone who has 10 kids, I've been pregnant a lot. And I know what it's like to be exhausted. I know what it's like to be sick. And in that particular episode of our lives, we ended up moving in when we had a four-month-old who was doing a sleep regression Ooh. and a brand new... Mostly ripped up new home because, well, not mostly ripped up, but like we moved in on our anniversary and my husband installed a shower head so we could wash off some of the grime and go to dinner and not fall asleep in the middle of dinner. So really, really, really hard season, really physically demanding season. Um, and I think that my number one piece of advice, well, two pieces of advice, one, find something that fuels your body. So, I mean, just practically speaking, 
beef liver capsules like are a huge source of energy Ooh, you my girl and nutrition for your body don't ignore the very practical things that your body needs to function correctly take power naps make sure that you have enough protein and you have enough water and you're drinking greens and you're you know looking at your nervous system and seeing if there's things so so definitely inform yourself on ways that you can practically boost your immune system and your energy and your mood and then simplify your routine this is not a season in your life to say yes to a bunch of things. This is not a season in your life to be superwoman. Um, I've tried. It was not good for my mental health or anyone in our family. Didn't go well. It's a season to say grace doesn't look like just giving up. Grace looks like paring things down to the absolute basics so I can serve my family in these kind of very simple ways that keep us going. Okay, so that's kind of like setting yourself up for success when it comes to moments that you need to discipline as a mom. Yeah, because if you aren't completely maxed out, even given your circumstances, if you aren't completely emotionally maxed out because you've set yourself up with some energy and you've taken that power nap, you're much more likely to respond kindly and yes, gently to that child, because I do think that the aspect of general parenting that I absolutely agree with is that we are to be gentle with our children. We're not supposed to be harsh and unforgiving. Hebrews 12, 11 has something really interesting to say about parents who dread disciplining. They find it you know, super difficult emotionally. It says, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Um, you brought this up earlier and I said, I want it. I had questions about it. Okay, so have you found that to be true? In yeah. the moments where you were like, it's hurting me more than it hurts you to discipline right now. Later, did you find that there was fruit that grew from those moments? A hundred percent in so many scenarios, but I'll give you one. Our oldest had a really difficult period and we had to work through a lot of things and he had to um, go through some consequences, some of them logical, some of them created by us, some kind of restitution that he had to do. Just like this stuff comes up with kids. It happens, right? Mm -hmm. And what he told me later was that while at the time that was incredibly painful and he didn't like it, this is, this is so key and it's why I struggle so much with gentle parenting. He told me later that he considered it a kindness because it showed him that he actually needed Jesus. Whoa. Like, and he did not, I did not, I mean, someone's going to say, no way, no way your 15-year-old said that. But he said, I think up to that point and that experience, I understood the concept of my being a sinner and my needing a savior as abstract, as something separate from me, as sure, I guess I believe it. And this is why we lay the foundation. This is why we preach truth to our children, because only the Lord can bring the revelation. But if we've never laid the foundation, yes, he can overcome that. Yes, he can bring revelation to their lives without us, but we will have missed so many opportunities to fulfill this responsibility to teach them God's ways and to teach them his truth about their need for a savior. So when that when that groundwork that we had laid for years was married with this hard experience and this discipline that he really didn't like, what he came out with afterwards was an understanding of his need for a savior. And that's huge. How can parents be sure that they're disciplining out of love and not anger? Well, I mean, a really good thing to do is to not discipline while you're angry, regardless of what it is. Now, when I say that, there are going to be some, you're like, what, 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 what? What if I am enraged that my child is running toward the road? Do I stand there and get calm before I go if, grab like, him? You, okay, let's do, use this as an example. Two little kids, one of them starts biting the other. As a seasoned mom, that's not going to make me angry. Okay, so I, th that's that seems like normal behavior to me. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> me, the non-parent, I'm like, this is a really good one. <laughs> okay, so what's something that would make a parent angry and then how do they discipline? Give us an example. I think the things that really get my goat are the super careless or the super ungenerous things, like cutting cruel words or... I knew this was going to hurt somebody and I did it anyway because I felt like it. And I just carelessly tossed this thing across and hit him in the head. That makes me upset because I love all of my children and I don't want one of my children harming either with words or actions or physical things, another child. Yeah. You kind of like your mama bear rises up. So you're, you're, you're triggered with anger and then you don't discipline right then and there? What do you do? Just like ignore it and then come back to it a couple hours later? No, it depends on what it is. If it is a careless behavior that is not a repetitive careless behavior, I'm probably not applying discipline. I'm having a conversation with the kid. Okay. I am coming up to him and saying as best I can in a calm voice, hey, 
this was not a good life choice. This was not respectful or kind. You need to go apologize, which I've heard a lot of gentle parents don't ask their kids to apologize. So, but yes, we are practicing the art of choosing to humble ourselves before someone that we have wronged and ask for forgiveness and then offering that forgiveness. Um, and I don't really care whether they feel super sorry or not. It is a mark of respect to someone else that you acknowledge that you have harmed them and you say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Um, so that's that's an example of showing respect to someone else. Um, if it is a discipline issue, as in they have been doing this thing with their new soccer ball multiple times and they know it's wrong, obviously the soccer ball goes away for a time. Um, and there might be another consequence. Your goal is to be as logical as possible with your consequences, which is why the soccer ball goes away. You want them to make the connection as many times as possible between what they actually did and why they're losing that privilege or ability or opportunity. Have you ever had to ask your kids for forgiveness? 100%. So interestingly enough, with this whole conversation on gentle parenting and the fact that I am not a proponent for it, although I am a proponent for being gentle to your kids. So I have an ebook and a chapter in my first book, Emma's for Mama, called The Gentleness Challenge. And the premise of it is that your goal is to speak only kind words in calm tones for 30 straight days. It's an anger detox, Ooh. basically. And it, it came about because the Lord really convicted my heart of one of those times I was trying to be a super mom and could put too many things on my plate. And I was struggling with postpartum rage, which is like a thing. That's not just like I was angry postpartum. It's like an unreasonable irritability and fixation on people frustrating you. And, and it's like hormonal. And it would be easy to say, this is hormonal. I have no control over it. And the Lord just kept convicting me kind of of the, the all things are valid. It was like, your hormones are valid, but your motivations and your responses to them and your actual responses to them are sinful. Mm, okay. And I am calling you to something radical. So I put it on social media. I had 2,000 people in it on the first day. And I was like, oh, so we're on to something. <laughs> I'm not the only mom. Is that it a is... lot of parents who struggle with like yelling and stuff? Yeah, 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 yeah. Or, or just even if they weren't acting on their anger, feeling irritated by their children all the time. Yeah. And then using sarcasm or, you know, just... Is sarcasm not biblical to use with kids? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not. Wait, tell me about this. If your child says, mama, I tried to do something, and maybe you don't believe them, you say, oh, I bet you did. <gasps> do you hear the disdain? Yeah. Do you hear the just like ripping into their heart tone of my voice? There are examples, especially with older kids, of sarcasm where you're being very playful and they're developmentally able to understand where you're coming from. But no, very small children, usually the way their brains work is very literal. And you don't want to say something that you don't mean or something cutting. What about the wives who are not on the same page as their husband in terms of discipline? Maybe they think that their husband is too harsh. And so that's why they have gravitated towards gentle parenting. They feel mm. like, I need to correct my husband's discipline style. So, and they might be right. There might be examples where they are definitely talking about a husband who could stand to gentle his approach. But my response is always going to be that one, two wrongs don't make a right. So if your husband is doing wrong and you are undercutting him, and that is also wrong biblically, it's not going to correct the course of your discipline. My advice is always, and people are like, oh, come on, give me something practical. Prayer is practical. The Bible tells us that it is effective, and the prayer of a righteous person affecteth much. And so my advice is always, first and foremost, pray for a change of heart, and this is what I always follow it up with, either yours or his. Because so many Ooh. wives, so many wives message me, and they're so sure they're right, and they will come back to me later sometimes and say, so I prayed for a heart change, and I sort of kind of threw mine in there at the end, and guess which heart he changed? Like, yep. And I'm so humbled, and I don't like it. Wow. But it was of the Lord, you know? I know how overwhelming it can feel to find out how many household items you use on a daily basis that might be endocrine disrupting and contributing to health issues and headaches for you and your family. So it's always a win for me when I can tell you about a non-toxic product that can be used for more than one thing. Olivia is 100% organic prebiotic body wash that 
feeds your skin's microbiome with what it really needs. Prebiotics are a nourishing superfood for the skin and diminish harmful bacteria to create a balanced skin pH. This unique body wash aids in skin restoration and get this, accelerates recovery for temperamental or problematic skin. Think eczema, psoriasis, keratosis, blemishes, sunspots, scars, and even wounds. Alivia's prebiotic body wash is so natural and pure, it can be used on the whole family, even babies. You can use it as shampoo and face wash. So see, this is what I mean about you can use one product for multiple things. Alivia does sell a separate face wash on their website. So let me just explain the difference between that one or using their body wash on the face. So both Alivia's facial and body washes begin with the same prebiotic base. Their body washes have 30% more coconut oil added to them compared to their facial wash, and their only scented formula has lavender essential oil added to it to give it even more healing benefits for the skin. So if you are more dry and you need more moisturizing like me, your best option is to use one of the prebiotic body washes on the face and the body if you want to, or if you are more oily, Alivia's prebiotic Facial cleanse is your best option. This is a super power product, as many of you are finding out after trying it, and then you're messaging me and telling me, find out more yourself. Try Alivia Prebiotic 100% Organic, Non-GMO, and Non-Toxic Body Wash at Alivia.com with code Alex15 for 15% off. That's A-L-E-A-V-I-A.com with code Alex15 for 15% off. Alivia.com with code Alex15 or click the link in the description. What should a Christian parent who is listening to this podcast and now feels incredibly guilty um, because maybe she is like, I am one of these people. I got sucked into the false goodness of gentle parenting. What should she do now? Well, first I'm going to say that the difference between guilt and conviction is that one comes from Satan. We are guilty of sin, but Christ's blood has atoned for us. So if we are in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor bad parenting philosophies, nor losing our temper, nor being self-righteous. None of these separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So first of all, remember that you are his, and he loves you, and he desires good for you. And So if you do feel that conviction from the Holy Spirit, my very practical advice would be unfollow accounts that are teaching you to stray from biblical truth. All of the gentle parenting mommy bloggers, their numbers are just dropping, (laughs) dropping after this. I doubt it. But I do think that there is an element of social media that has such good. It has, we have the ability I mean, I get contacted daily by people that are saying this had an impact on me. And sometimes I'm not a crier, but ask Sean. Sometimes I'm just tearing up because I'm like, Lord, who am I that you would give me the opportunity to reach people I've never even met before? This is amazing. So it can be used for good. But my next exhortation would be log your time on social media versus your time in scripture and see how they stack up. Because if you have two hours on parenting accounts and five minutes in scripture, it's no surprise to me that you might have a lack of scriptural knowledge or a cherry-picked scriptural knowledge or just maybe not even an understanding of where you're supposed to start. So yeah, get into God's word. You have two beautiful parenting books. The first one is Emma's for Mama. Tell us about that one. So I told you about that, What Do You Want to Know Wednesday Q&A, and I have wanted to be a published author since I was six years old. It's the only, quote, dream of my heart. I'm a pragmatist through and through. I'm not a dreamer. I'm not a pie-in-the-sky girl. It is the only dream of my heart that has stayed true through my entire life. And the Lord didn't see fit to bring it to fruition until I was 37, I believe, 38, 38. I don't know how old I was. Um, And in his timing, in his way, in his goodness and his kindness. It just so cool because one of my big fears in writing that book, in writing any book, was the amount of research an extremely busy homeschooling mom was going to have to do to get this right, right? Like, you want to get it right. And then I realized as I'm doing the outline for this book, 
that have been doing this Q&A, which is basically a finger on the pulse of Christian moms, their worries, their fears, their sorrows, their panic attacks, their biblical questions, their cultural questions. And I've been doing this already for like a year at this point. And as I'm thinking about my chapter structures, I'm realizing I know exactly what to write. I know the top 10 things that moms want to know. And the, the, the book has 17 chapters, so maybe the top 17. So it was so cool that I had done this market research and that the Lord had like given me this conviction to spend two hours every Wednesday on something that seemingly, it didn't bring me any money. It was, you know, something that I had to do during nap time. It was a discipline that I had to do. Some of the questions are ridiculous. <laughs> Some of them are awesome. Some of them you're like, I cannot believe that just got asked. And they make your brain hurt. They honestly do. But it's how I found the topics. Holy yeah, Spirit tell me led. a couple, just a handful of the topics that are in Emma's for Mama. Sure. Self-care versus soul care. Because we have this huge thing that says you take care of you. You can't pour from an empty cup. And then you have to compare that to light of scripture. What is it? What does it actually have to say about that? And my contention is that while me time or breaks are wonderful gifts from the Lord, if we don't recognize that that's where we're coming from and we're always striving for them, our cup's never going to be filled anyway, if it's not with him. Um, mommy guilt. Like, Ooh. should I be feeling bad about this decision or that decision. And I've kind of touched on that already. What's the difference between guilt and what's the difference between Holy Spirit conviction? And I delve into that. I have a chapter called The Profession of Motherhood, where I talk about that our professional standards should start at home. And, and that, not at the workplace? Yeah. <gasps> That's good. Right. Because if we already are moms, it's one thing if you're not a mom yet, but if you already are a mom, the Lord is giving you these souls that are eternal to invest in. And if they're an afterthought, we've got a problem. So talk about the birds and the bees. What else do I talk about? Talk about community, because also comparison, the comparison trap is so huge within moms. So I've got a chapter called No Two Good Moms Look Alike. Oh, I love that. As long as we are adhering to the tenets of scripture, and as long as we are listening to Holy Spirit conviction, instead of just calling it shame and, and dismissing it and saying that's a, like a construct of society, the patriarchy made me feel bad or what, whatever patriarchy. it is. If, if we're not, if we're willing to be humbled and we're willing to be taught by God's word, by Titus two godly mentors, by the Holy Spirit stirring in our hearts, then by all means, homeschool or don't homeschool, um, have a side business or don't have a side business. Build that house or don't build that house. Don't look over there and go, she built a house, therefore I need to go. No, nah, not if that's not what the, don't homestead. If that's not what the Lord has for you, just because yeah. it's popular on Instagram, and right? And you have a podcast of the same name, yeah. Emma's for Mama, yeah. which we'll link all of this in the in the show notes. Um, but you also have a brand new book that you brought with you yeah, today. Yeah, I did. Ta-da! Hard is not the same thing as bad. The perspective shift that could completely change the way you mother. Very nice radio voice, Alex. Very nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my heart's cry for the last 10 years. The intro, um, which I don't have time to read to you because Alex and I are just having so much fun, but I will read you the very last part of the intro because it talks all about the struggles that I had with my first set of twins who were extremely hard toddlers, like the hardest hard toddlers. Sensory issues and meltdowns and screaming at me in the car all the time. And I end with this. What if my twin girls' seemingly meaningless melodramas were not a punishment, but rather a mercy from the Lord? A daily opportunity to die to myself, to root out impatience and self-indulgence, to grow my capacity for both empathy and tenacity to make me a more creative mama, and ultimately to drive me to my knees at the foot of the hard, painful, bloody cross my Savior endured, not randomly or without purpose, but for my ultimate benefit. What if good could come from being dragged th through the emotional ringer on the daily? What if, instead of despising the hard and kicking at it in contempt and disgust, I embraced it with open, if faltering arms and leaned into its potential to transform my view of God? and of his goodness in allowing me to walk a difficult path. What if I truly let myself believe that hard is not the same thing as bad? So it's about going through difficult moments as a mother and how to kind of see the bright side. And it's so much deeper than the bright side because it's not toxic positivity. It is saying, it's reframing our focus from, I will never get through this. This is the worst I hate this, which are all feelings that I have felt and acknowledge in here, to instead, what is the Lord teaching me through this? Not like, what's the happy moment in this? Because there may not be a happy moment in the midst of the suffering. 
but the Lord can still use it for our good and his glory. And I keep hearing in reviews over and over again, it's not just for moms. And my husband contributed to it as well. So it's definitely for dads. But I really think this perspective shift is something that our culture needs in general. I want to be really careful not to generalize gentle parents into a category of doing it all wrong. I think we, I think we have talked about plenty of things that have helped to point out that we're not just trying to bash them. But what I see a lot of times from gentle parenting accounts is a ton of generalizing. And they probably feel this way towards, like, that things are coming toward them as generalities as well. Oh, you're just permissive parents. You don't have any about, you know, and they say, no, 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 no. And I get that. But, for example, I was on an account one time that was describing the difference between gentle parenting, meaning that it was the thing that we have found that has answered all parenting woes. It's, it's the answer, right? That was the conclusion. The difference between gentle parenting and I think they said traditional parenting, if I remember correctly, which could mean almost anything. Yeah, I mean, that's way too broad. Well, and even within the gentle parenting world, you're going to find a lot of people that disagree about certain tenets of gentle parenting. We touched on the broadest ones, but you're going to find people that are like, oh, no, it's conscious parenting or peaceful parenting. So it makes sense that you have to have these labels that kind of you can stuff a bunch of people into, right? So I think they use the term gentle parenting and then traditional parenting. And they basically said the difference is... A gentle parent comes alongside their child, they come down on their level, and they meet them where they are, whereas a traditional parent is standing over that child and pointing their finger at them and saying, thou shalt. And it was such a broad statement. that I'm just very vivid. Yeah, it, it, it does. It conjures an image that immediately makes you kind of shudder and say, Ooh, well, like, I, don't I don't want to do that. that. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we have to be careful not to do the same thing on our side, where we say all a gentle parent is doing is just warping their child for life and letting them do whatever they want whenever they want, because they're not going to be, want to be characterized that way either. You know. So I think we need to offer grace on both sides and not do something to one side that we don't want done to us. Find both of Abby's books, her Instagram, everything in the show notes. Abby, uh, thank you so much for coming on The Spillover. Thanks for having me. I hope for the mom servatives, this episode encouraged you in your parenting, number one. But two, I hope it brought clarity for you on the topic of discipline, the philosophy of gentle parenting, and answered some questions that you've had. Between this episode and last week's daycare episode, it has been a spicy two weeks covering topics that are very taboo amongst moms. So I hear in my DMs, if you have ever learned something new by listening to this podcast, please leave a five-star review and send this YouTube link to your friends or your mom friends or your family members, okay? Post the podcast link to your stories. Share what this podcast meant to you as a parent. Did it challenge you? Did it confirm things for you? Do you wholeheartedly disagree? Share that. Let's have a discussion about it, especially if you think that we were wrong. Look for a brand new episode of The Spillover next Thursday at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, anywhere you get your podcasts, and subscribe to Real Alex Clark on YouTube. I'm Alex Clark, and this is The Spillover. Love you, mean it. Bye. Bye.